Hello there and welcome back to a new session from the Divine Healing Teaching Series. If you remember, we are in the last chapter of this series where we're talking about practical ways of ministering healing. And we're trying to answer all kinds of questions, practical questions on how to minister healing to the sick. And we discussed, we got to discuss uh, two points on our last session about uh, the speaking of words, speaking of words of commands and laying our hands. And then we talked about faith and perseverance. And today we're continuing with the third sub, sub chapter in this big chapter where we talk about our responsibility. And here and there, uh, in, in the past sessions, I, I talked a little bit of our responsibility, that the responsibility of healing the sick has shifted from God to us. Amen? And God has given us in Christ all that He could give us. I said it so many times and I want to say it again. God has given us in Christ all that he could give us. Now it's our responsibility to make it work. And this can be both exciting and somehow condemning. If you have never been used with this kind of teaching, it might condemn you, but I'll talk in a, in a few minutes about ways to avoid that condemnation and to get out of the condemnation and focus your energy and your holy anger on someone else, amen? So it can be exciting and condemning, but it's most, mostly encouraging. It's mostly exciting because we know we can do something about it by the power of God that he has given us. And a sign of spiritual maturity is when you start doing the will of God from your own initiative. When we start doing what God has said in his word on our own initiative. And I'll give an example here. Do you want your child to remain always a child and to expect always to be told what to do, even to take the garbage out? No, we don't want that. We want our children to grow and to become into adults and to start taking initiative. You are rejoicing when you see your child taking the garbage on his own initiative out without you telling him to do so. It's a sign that your son or your daughter has grown up and it's towards maturity. In the same way is God with us. He treated us as children. Galatians 4 tells us that when he gave the law, he gave the rules. And there were so many rules that he gave to the people of Israel. But in the New Testament, the, the, it's, it's, a new, it's a new thing that God expects us to grow up and to start doing things on our own initiative, things that he has already said or spoken in his word. Amen? And we don't need special leadings from the Holy Spirit to do what the word already says to do. And I'll say it again, this is so powerful. We don't need special leadings from the Holy Spirit to do what the word already told us to do. Amen? Paul, if we look at the Apostle Paul, the Apostle Paul did whatever he thought best at that moment in time with the knowledge that he had. He did whatever he thought best and based on what the Word of God was saying to him at that time. And that is why we see in a certain uh, situation in, uh, in Acts that he was stopped from going to Macedonia at one time because... He did not wait on special leadings. He was taking one by one the cities and going through them and preaching the gospel. He was not waiting for special leadings. And when uh, the Holy Spirit didn't want him to go to Macedonia, as he decided, then the Holy Spirit stopped him. But Paul didn't wait for special leadings from the Holy Spirit. When there's a special leading, that's great. It's awesome. You're more confirmed and more strong. However, if you don't have a special leading, just go with what you know. The rule of thumb is to do what the word says, to do the word. 
And it's our responsibility. And I'll take a few passages from the Old Testament and the New Testament to show us, to show you that it's our responsibility to do what God has already told us to do. And I'll start uh, with the first passage from Exodus chapter 14, verses 9 to 16. And if you have your Bibles ready, let's read it together. I'll be reading from the New King James Version, but you're welcome to use any English translation that you have available. Let's read it together. So the Egyptians pursued them, all the horses and chariots of Pharaoh, his horsemen and his army, and overtook them, camping by the sea beside Pi Hahiroth before Baal Zephon. And when Pharaoh drew near, the children of Israel lifted their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians marched after them. So they were very afraid, and the children of Israel cried out to the Lord. Then they said to Moses, because there were no graves in Egypt, have you taken us away to die in the wilderness? Why have you so dealt with us to bring us up out of Egypt? Is this not the word that we told you in Egypt, saying, Let us alone that we may, may serve the Egyptians? For it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than that we, sh than that we should die in the wilderness. And Moses said to the people, be, uh, uh, pay attention here, do not be afraid, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall see again and no more forever. The Lord will fight for you and you shall hold your peace. See this kind of inspirational and full of faith speech. And he's, he's putting everything on the Lord, on, the, on God. He will accomplish for you. He will fight for you and then verse 15 Moses has a shock and the Lord said to Moses why do you cry to me is this shocking why do you cry to me tell the children of Israel to go forward but lift up your rod and stretch out your hand over the sea and divide it and the children of Israel shall go on dry ground through the midst of the sea Probably Moses had a big shock here. The Lord will do. The Lord will fight. And the Lord says, why do you cry to me? Why are you saying that I'm going to do? Just lift up your rod, stretch your hand over the sea and divide it. Notice Moses' preconception when he encouraged the people in verse 13. He will accomplish. The Lord will fight for you. He was waiting for God to do something. And that's how we are Christians today all the time. We are waiting for God to do something. But God asks him back, why do you cry to me? You, you lift up the rod and you divide it. God didn't say, you lift up the rod and I will divide it. But you will divide it. You, Moses. Of course, it is the power of God, but it's you I gave responsibility to take the people of Israel from Egypt into the promised land. Another principle here is that if God called you to do something and you face a roadblock or an obstacle, you can rest assured that that obstacle is not from God because he told you to do the mission. In that case, you have the responsibility to overcome it. If you see a sickness, God is always against sickness. You have the responsibility to, to push away that sickness, to destroy that sickness and bring healing. In other words, Moses was saying to God, God, you told us to go to a promised land and here we have a problem. The Red Sea, do something, God. And God says back, what have I told you? Take my children out of Egypt and take them to the promised land. I didn't tell you to get them out of Egypt, then get them to the Red Sea and die there. So whatever you got to do to make this happen and to take the people of Israel to Canaan, you do it and I'll back you up. You do it and I'll help you. I'll back you up, but you do it. See the difference? Even from the Old Testament, God was longing for his people to take initiative and to do his word and to do what he asked them to do. Let's see one passage from the New Testament, from Matthew 8, 23 to 27. Now when he got into a boat, it talks about Jesus, his disciples followed him, and suddenly a great tempest arose on the sea so that the boat was covered with, with the waves. But he was asleep. 
I wonder how Jesus slept on that storm. Then his disciples came to him and awoke him, saying, Lord, save us, we are perishing. But he said to them, Why are you fearful, O you of little faith? Then he arose and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm. So the men marveled, saying, Who can this be that even the winds and the sea obey him? Amen? In this situation, it seems that Jesus was expecting the disciples to calm the winds and the sea, or at least not to fear. Jesus didn't play with words. Jesus didn't play stupid. He said, why are you fearful? In other words, I've been with you so long. You know me. You know what I can do and you can do. Do it yourselves. You have little faith. Do not be afraid. I think this phrase, do not be afraid, from Jesus' mouth came out so many times. Do not be afraid. Have the faith of God. So Jesus was expecting the disciples to calm the storm. Even before he died on the cross, even before they were new creations, all the more after the cross, he expects us to calm the storms in our lives and to speak to the winds, speak to the mountains, speak to the sea, to calm down. And they will calm down. Whatever you say without doubting, it will happen to you and to me. Amen. Another passage from Matthew 14, verses 14 to 16. And when Jesus went out, he saw a great multitude, and he was moved with compassion for them and healed their sick. When it was evening, his disciples came to him, saying, This is a deserted place, and the hour is already late. Send the multitudes away, that they may go into the villages and buy themselves food. But Jesus said to them, They do not need to go away. You give them something to eat. Isn't that interesting? You give them something to eat. Jesus again here was expecting the disciples to catch the vision. He was expecting them to multiply the breads and start thinking supernaturally. He wasn't playing stupid. He was aware of the great crowd. And he was probably probably even aware that they didn't have the natural means and resources to feed all that crowd. He knew that. Jesus wasn't playing dumb. He knew the whole situation and still he asked them to give them something to eat. If he expected them to do something about it, it means they could have done it. Can I say it again? If Jesus expected the disciples to feed the crowds, that means they could have done it. Amen? It wasn't saying, he wasn't saying those things just to frustrate them or to show off what he could do. Jesus wasn't like that. He didn't want to frustrate them. Whatever he said, he was genuine and the disciples could do it and they lost the opportunity. These are opportunities to work, to function in the supernatural. And that's why the Bible says when we have different trials to rejoice. Because that creates for us a weight of glory. It's an opportunity to exercise your faith and to do the word of God and to see supernatural things happening in your lives. Luke 10, 19 says this. This is one of my favorite verses. Behold, I give you authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Don't be afraid that the devil will hurt you. Nothing by any means shall hurt you. That's what Jesus said. You are supposed to trample on, the, on all the power of the enemy. All of it. On serpents, on demons, on sickness. You, are, you have the authority. You have the authority. God gave us the authority to do that. To trample. And that's so exciting. Jesus here gave the disciples and to us implicitly the authority to trample over all the power of the enemy. And God in his sovereignty will not intervene in things that he has already given us authority to do something about. Amen? He gave us the authority. He doesn't intervene in those things where he has given us authority. Let's see one more passage from Ephesians chapter 6, 12, verse 12. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood 
but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Who is wrestling here? God or us? For we do not wrestle. We do not wrestle. We wrestle with principalities. So we are the ones wrestling, not God. He will not come and fight our battles. Amen? James 4 verse 7. Another passage from the New Testament. Therefore, submit to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Who is supposed to resist the devil? God? No, of course not. Us. We are called and supposed to resist the devil and he will flee from us. That's what the Bible says. We are in the subchapter where we talk about our responsibility. We are to resist sickness, to resist the devil, and he will flee. He has to flee from us. 2 Corinthians 5 verses 18 to 19. Now all things are of God who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them and has committed to us and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. God has given us the ministry of reconciliation to distribute life and heal people and preach the gospel and has committed to us the word of reconciliation in the same way we have responsibility to preach the gospel to the lost is the same responsibility to when it comes to sickness and healing we are responsible to heal the sick cast out the devil deliver people and heal people amen let's see a few more passages about the Holy Spirit being our help, and we are the ones that are supposed to do the work. Let's read John chapter 16, verse 7. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It, it is to your advantage that I go away, says Jesus. For if I do not go away, the Helper will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. Notice how Jesus calls the Holy Spirit the Helper. He is the Helper. He's not the one doing the things. He's helping us. And let's see what we are supposed to do in James chapter 1, verses 21 to 25. Therefore lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. But be doers of the word. You be doers of the word and not hearers only deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man observing his natural face in a mirror, for he observes himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it, and is not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the word, this one will be blessed in what he does." As we've seen in John 16 and now in James, the Holy Spirit is the helper and we, the believers, are the doers of the word and not the other way around. Can a human being heal? Can I heal anyone? Can you heal anyone by your own strength? No, of course not. We cannot heal in our own strength. The Holy Spirit is the one actually healing through other through people he is the healer he is the helper but he's doing those things through us that's that's how god chose to do things he's doing those things he doesn't have authority as a spirit to function in this world we have authority with our physical bodies to function in this world that's why demons want so much to possess us so that they could do things in the, in the material world. So in the same way, the Holy Spirit doesn't have authority to do things on his own on the earth. He needs our authority. He does it through us because he has given it to us. Oh, amen. He can try to influence people, to speak to people, but he doesn't have the authority to heal by himself. Let's see a, a few more things here. The word or the perfect law of liberty that James talks about shows us who Jesus is. That's the perfect law of liberty. It shows us who, who Christ is. Notice that the passage from James doesn't say that we are looking to a portrait, but into a mirror. 
where, where, when we look into the world. That means if we look into a mirror, the world is our mirror, mirror. When we, when we look into that mirror, we see ourselves. We see the new us, the new selves who are recreated in the image of God. The word of God doesn't show us that we are sinners because later on the passage encourages us not to forget what we saw in the mirror. For sure, it doesn't tell us or to not forget that we are sinners, that we are ugly and evil. It rather says to not forget that we look like Jesus and to do the word, that we look like Christ, our new selves. That's what, that's what we're supposed to not forget, that we look like Jesus. We are Christ on earth. As Christ is, so are we on this earth. 1 John 4, 17. What is the word in this case, in, the, in what we're talking here? The word to us is lay our hands on the sick and they will recover. Mark 16 verse 20. And they went out and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word through the accompanying signs. Amen. So the Lord here was working with the word and confirming the word through accompanying signs. But the word came first. The signs were accompanying something that went before the signs. And that was the word. The signs and wonders will come when we act, when we do the word as the Bible tells us to do. And when we teach the word, the signs will come. If we teach the word and not something else or just reading the verses from the Bible, we need to teach the word. And I'll give an example here. Have you ever been on a construction site? Have you ever seen a lifting crane? The man commanding the machine, that lifting crane, sits down, relaxed, maybe he drinks a coffee, and just pushes a button. But the crane does the heavy lifting, the big stuff, lifts the, the heavy lifting. If the crane is not used, it will not lift anything. Just by himself, that man cannot lift anything. He needs to use the crane. The man is hired to do the will of the company, but he cannot lift all the heavy blocks by himself. And we know that. He needs a helper. He needs that heavy crane that he commands by pushing a button. He is given a help by the company to fulfill the company's will. But on the other hand, if the man doesn't command the crane, doesn't push the button, the crane will not lift anything. So in the same way, the Holy Spirit is our helper. He is the lifting crane. He does the heavy lifting, but we are the ones pushing the buttons. We are the ones doing the word, preaching the word, and laying our hands, speaking words of commands, and the Holy Spirit is the one doing the thing. And not only that, the Holy Spirit also knows us very well that most of the times he will prepare ahead of time what we need to minister to the sick. He, th he will think ahead of us. Think of a surgeon with his nurses giving him the tools needed. Another example is like the, the more that doctor, that, the more that surgeon works with his nurses, the nurses will anticipate, will start thinking like the surgeon. They will already know what the doctor needs at every moment of a surgery. That's how the Holy Spirit is. He will anticipate. He will prepare us in advance. Another example is with a, with a licensed electrician, electrician and his helper. The helper prepares everything needed in advance, but only the electrician is licensed to do the work. So in the same way, we are, the believers are the ones licensed to do the work of God, the work of the kingdom. The Holy Spirit is the helper who does the heavy lifting, who prepares things in advance, who prepares us, who builds us up. But we are the ones doing the work and not the, way, the other way around. We, so many times we expect the Holy Spirit to do something and we are just standing on the side and interceding and imploring God to do. This will, nothing will happen. Because we are the ones to do the miraculous, to work out the salvation that he has already given us. And I'll give also another example with a pastor in a church. A pastor is not supposed to do the job himself and the others look at him how he does it. Amen. 
The same goes for apostles, teachers, prophets. They do some, some stuff because they need to train others. They need to show others how to do it. But they are not supposed to do it them by just themselves. They are helpers to the church. They are supposed to help the church to do the same things. And the pastor is supposed to lead from behind, delegate others to do the ministry and help them to do the ministry. Show them and then let people do ministry. That's what the role of a pastor is. And that's what the role of a helper is, to push you from behind. That's the role of the Holy Spirit, to push you, to help you, to delegate you. But you are, we are the ones, the believers are the ones called to do the ministry. Amen? And I'll give one more example here on this subsection on our responsibility and then I'll close. There's a TV show series called New Amsterdam and maybe you heard of it or not in which a doctor takes over a big hospital and then the first time he meets the doctors he comes into a meeting with all the doctors with the whole personnel of the hospital uh, doctors, surgeons, nurses and the first question he asks them is this how can I help? I help you and you help the patients. How can I help you help the patients? This is how the Holy Spirit is with us. The Holy Spirit tells us, how can I help you? I help you and you help the patients. That's what the Holy Spirit is for us, amen? But it's our responsibility. And I will say now something quite difficult to receive, but it's true. Every time we don't receive the promises of God, we don't get the promises of God to come to pass in our lives at the time they need it to come to pass, at the time they need to come to pass, the thief gets a victory. We don't get the victory. The thief, the devil gets the victory. God doesn't get any praises. If we don't have the, if we don't get the promises of God fulfilled in our lives at the time that we need them to come to pass. God gets the victory when a promise of his comes to pass, when something that he said in his word is fulfilled on earth. That's when God gets all the victory and all the praise, when the promise comes to pass. Amen. Let's move on to the fourth subchapter where we talk about not being condemned. We don't need to be condemned when we hear this stuff, these things that I'm, tell, I'm sharing with you. And I was saying earlier that when we hear all these words that I'm teaching and think of all the cases when we could have done something, that's the problematic part. We think in the past of, uh, to people that died on us, they were sick, and we think of all those cases that we could have done something and we didn't know, we didn't do anything, and we lost. That's the thing that might get us condemned. However, Paul says this in Philippians Chapter 3, verses 12 to 14. It's encouraging. It says this, Not that I have already attained or am already perf perfected, but I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold on me, of me. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead. I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. So you see what the Paul says here? I don't look, I don't, I forget those things which are behind and I look forward. Use this opportunity, this anger, this condemnation. Use it from now on as, as long as you live to do damage into the kingdom of the devil, into the kingdom of darkness. Channel this anger, this holy anger, this condemnation, this uh, the, the, you being upset of your past losses, of your past defeats, and channel it towards the devil. Amen? You don't need to feel condemned because there's a thief, there's a devil who is always setting you up to fail and deceiving you and me. He's deceiving us. That's his job. He sneaks in and he steals the word. That's what he does. You need to realize that he is to be blamed. The devil is to be blamed. We have our part of blame, but he is mostly to be blamed because he is deceiving us. He's stealing his word from us. And he, he, he uses all these strategies to get us to not have victories. And I'll give an ex another example here. If a big dog comes to you and starts chewing at your leg and you see a stick near you, are you going to use the stick to beat yourself or beat the dog? You can beat yourself, but you need to beat the dog. Here's the problem. 
Satan comes in and he rips us off. He gets us to believe in something that is not true. He gets us off the word in fear, in worry, and then the promises don't come to pass. Don't come to pass. So take the stick and beat the hell out of the dog. The dog is the problem. Use this regret and anger inside you against him, not against yourself. Amen? So be encouraged. Don't stay under condemnation because you didn't know a, a lot of things that I didn't know. When I found out these things, I had, the same, I had to go through the same thing. Because today in the body of Christ, so much is taught that God is supposed to do this and that and we are supposed to wait. And you didn't know more. But now you know more. You can do something about it. You can do something new. Forget what was behind and live to fight another day. Now when you face other, other challenges, other sick people, people that are dying, you can do something about it. And even when you cannot make it through your faith, through the faith, you, you are not releasing yet enough faith. You, are not, you don't have enough word in you. Don't be condemned. Don't let condemnation to kill your faith. R rise up and leave to fight another battle amen and put more word in you and next time it will be much better amen press on that's what paul says i press toward the goal press on to the prize press on to see supernatural things happening in your life press on until you have the first victory and then it will be much easier much more easy let's go now to the fifth sub chapter where you talk about the power of god being mechanical the power of god is mechanical and it might be a surprise and a shock to you, but that's the truth. God has put certain laws in place in nature, like the rotation of the earth, day and night, the sun and moon, and they all go mechanically through repetition. He doesn't need to specifically attend to those laws. Isn't that right? They work all the time under the same conditions. God doesn't attend to them. He just put them in motion and they just go by repetition. The same is with the power of God in the New Testament and with healing. Faith and power are mechanical, meaning that there's a clear process that God has put in place of how they should work. It's not confusing, it's not vague, it's not ambiguous. We make it that way, but God didn't make it that way. And under the right conditions, they will always work. Faith and power will always work the same way and produce the same results. And I'll say it again because it might be new to you. Under the right conditions, faith and power for healing will always work, always work the same way and produce the same results. It's a repeatable process. Moreover, they can be used at your own will, at our own will, faith and power. When God told Adam that the day he will eat of the forbidden tree, he will surely die, right there, a spiritual law was put in motion. It wasn't God watching to see if, God, if Adam would eat and then strike him dead. Do you see God doing that? No. The law itself that God spoke into motion caused Adam and Eve to die when they ate of the, of the forbidden tree. It was like a curse. Probably we understand better a curse. When God spoke, it was something that was active. It was an active word. And when Adam and Eve transgressed and uh, trampled on that law, they were, they were damaged by it. They died. In the same way, the words God decreed about us, about how faith and power should work, they are spiritual laws put already in motion in the spiritual realm, in the invisible realm, in the heavenly places. When we align, our, align ourselves with them, with those laws, with those words, they produce the same results for anyone, anywhere, anytime. Isn't that exciting? That God is not partial. You're not supposed to wait for him to do something. You just need to align yourself with those laws and find out the conditions under which those laws function and work and then go do them. Do the word. Do what God has said. Align yourself with the word. Amen. Let's read from Matthew chapter 7 verses 21 to 23. It says this. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. 
Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Let's see, what, what, let's see a few things in this, in this passage. The principle here is that technically there can be people who find out the spiritual laws that are in motion. They discover how to believe either intentionally or by mistake. They discover how, how to believe, how those laws function. And they, re they discover how to release power and they manage to heal themselves and even heal others. I saw it with my own eyes on YouTube. An unbeliever, a, a, a witch, a doctor somewhere in the world healing other people. And people were coming to him and he was laying his hands over people and he was healing them. And he didn't have Jesus. He didn't have Jesus Christ. However, these people... As I said, this doctor, they might not even be born again. So it's possible for you to do miracles to heal other people uh, without being born again because there are certain laws and if you find them out and you align themselves with them, then they work for anyone. So these people use the principles because they are mechanical, but they don't have a relationship with Christ as we've seen in this passage. They have a certain ability to use those principles, but not the legal authority. They don't have a legal authority to function in the spiritual realm, exactly like the devil. They don't, and they don't even have the help of the Holy Spirit. And uh, I can give a few examples here. I, I don't know if you heard, there's a Dr. Joe Dispenza. On YouTube, you can search him out that talks about the brain, the mind, and about these laws, and he's not a Christian. Then there's the so-called The Secret. If you, you, you can Google it on YouTube or Google, uh, and you'll find out The Secret, how to think positively and how to make things work in your life by, by uh, uh, changing your mind, by uh, overwriting your brain. And then The Law of Attraction. It's along the same lines with The Secret. This is The Secret the law of attraction. These are all things that uh, try to use the principles that God has put in place in the spiritual realm, but without the legal authority and without the relationship with Christ. So now if an unbeliever can do all those things, all the more we who are in Christ can do them. But we do them in the right way and make sure that we are first in Christ. We have a relationship with Christ. And then we go do those things. We have been so robbed because we didn't think outside of the box. We just thought the religious language and we kept ourselves in a religious box for years. And we didn't allow science and the word of God to connect and to see how we can do the word. What God has put in place in the spiritual realm for us to use. And that's so exciting. So the problem in the church has been that we made the relationship with God the basis of releasing or receiving that power. We thought that the moment we come into Christ, just by being the Christ, we just receive power and we don't do anything, uh, anything about it. We just wait for God to pour out his power and then we, do, we start doing things. God has already given us all the power when we receive the Holy Spirit. But we need to learn how to work it out, how to use that power. So if you're always waiting for God to do something, to still give you power, you're still waiting to receive, then you will be always manipulated and frustrated. You'll always wait for something that it will not happen because God has already put in place what we need to do the miraculous. Amen. So we need understanding. We need knowledge. We need to destroy those traditions of men, those things that kept us locked, that kept the power locked inside of us. Let's read one more passage from Luke 10 verses 17 to 20, where it says this. Then the 70 returned with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Behold, I give you the authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. 
Jesus says here, yeah guys, the casting out of demons thing is great, but rejoice that you are in a relationship with me. Not that you're casting out demons, it's great, but you need to first be in a relationship with me to have your names written in heaven. One more passage, 1 Corinthians 13 verse 2. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. We are still in the subchapter where we talk about the power of God being mechanical and a repeatable process. So here in 1 Corinthians 13 verse 2, technically it seems that we can have all the faith to move mountains, without having love or without being in Christ. You can, someone can have faith without having love and without being Christ. Look at what he says. And though I have all the faith so that I could remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. So you could have faith to remove mountains and have not love, not being Christ. Amen? I don't know if you haven't noticed that. So if, so if you don't have love, if you are not in Christ, you are nothing. You didn't achieve anything for God. You will not be rewarded for anything. You can go to hell. Even if you used your faith to move mountains. Even if you used your faith to heal the sick. But if you use your faith through love and from the standpoint of a personal relationship with God, then it matters. It counts. That's what Galatians 5, 6 says. It counts with the, that faith should work through love. It's not that faith works only through love, as many Christians believe from that verse, Galatians 5, 6. Because faith can work anyway, as we saw in 1 Corinthians 13. But what Galatians 5, 6 says is that it's, that it's faith working through love, which counts, which remains, and for which you'll get the reward. So whenever you use your faith out of love, out of a relationship in Christ, that's when it counts. That one, that's when it remains and you will be rewarded for it. Amen? So you first need to have a relationship with Christ and then you can use that mechanical power of God, faith, uh, and you have legal authority to do so. So while unbelievers can tap into some miraculous things, they are still limited because they don't have the Holy Spirit. They don't have the fullness of God. They don't have the recreated spirit inside of them. They don't even have legal authority to use those principles. So they are limited. They can tap into some miraculous things here and there. But we as new creations can all the more use those principles in our advantage and to do things for God and to deliver people, to heal people. Amen? So the power of God is like electrical power. Under the same condition, it will always work the same way and it will produce the same results. And you can repeat the process at your own will. You can heal anyone, anytime, anywhere uh, of any sickness. Amen? Let's move on. Uh, Subchapter 6, where we talk about the, the, about the fact that recovery can happen progressively. And recovery in itself is a progressive process. Sometimes healing and recovery can begin at the moment you pray or command sickness to go and then continue to work on the person in stages towards wholeness. Mark 16 says that we will lay our hands over sick people and they will recover. It doesn't say instant healing and recovery can happen progressively. So the person can be in a state of healing, although it's not yet completed. This is not the ideal, of course, and it's not what we want. We want instant, and it's possible to have instant healings, but sometimes re uh, progressive healing can happen too, and we don't need to close the door to that. But now, uh, one more thing. This kind of progressive recovery works very well with believers, with Christians, but if you're on the street, you kind of need the instant, because otherwise you don't have the witness and the sign for unbelievers of the power of God. You cannot uh, tell someone on the street that go on and continue and you'll get healed someday. You will not be able to testify anyone. That's, that will not be a sign for anyone, amen? So we want the instant. We look towards the instant, but in the same time, be open also for progressive recovery. Don't think that if something doesn't happen immediately, that nothing uh, really happens actually in the, in the person's body. Something has started to happen the moment you commanded, the moment you prayed and laid your hands over that person. Amen? Next subchapter, 7. We talk about the fact that we don't need 
much information about the sickness. Not much information is needed. And I'll say why. Let's read the passage from Mark chapter 10 verses 51 to 52. So Jesus answered and said to him, What do you want me to do for you? The blind man said to him, Rabuni, that I may receive my sight. Then Jesus said to him, Go your way, your faith has made you, made you well. And immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus on the road. Notice here that this blind man was blind and wanted to see. And Jesus didn't ask him, how did he get blind? Do you see anywhere uh, asking him, to, trying to find out more information? Jesus didn't say, what brought this blindness on you? Or was anyone in your family blind? Or does blindness run in your family? Or is there a genetic thing or a spiritual generational thing here that we need to go back and discover what it is? Go to the root. Jesus didn't say anything of that matter. As Jesus did it, you don't need to know a lot of details about the sickness. Why? Because the solution is the same. No matter the sickness, the power of God is greater than any genetic or generational curse. Plus, knowing details about the sickness can weaken your faith most of the times. When you know more about it, your faith shrinks and is undermined. What if that sickness is from birth? What if you find out that a sickness is from birth? It is all the same to God, but to you, it will seem like a mountain compared to a headache or to a fever. If you find out that a sickness is from birth, I don't know why, but that's how we behave. To us, it becomes a mountain all of a sudden. The more information and input we have about a sickness from people, the less we'll look at it from God's perspective. We will start looking at it from our human perspective. If you have some information, great, but don't look for so much information about a sickness because it will do damage to your faith. The main root or cause of any sickness and disease is the devil. He's the only source. All the other so-called causes are intermediary or subordinate to the devil. They don't matter. They all go to the same source. So, and you have the same solution for all the problems. So why would you need so much information? Think about the woman with the issue of blood in Matthew 9, 20 to 23 and Luke 8. Uh, 43 to 48 is the same story when the woman, woman with the issue of blood touched Jesus and she was instantly healed. This woman with the issue of blood got healed and Jesus didn't know a thing about who got healed. He didn't even know the person who got healed. He just knew someone got healed, but he didn't know the sickness. He didn't know the person. He didn't know if she deserved it or not. He didn't know how she got it. That sickness. Yet she was able, that woman was able to dictate her own healing by her saying, if I only can touch his garment, I will be made whole. She dictated her own healing when she said that. Jesus didn't know anything about it. The woman was able to pull her own healing from Jesus. Isn't that so interesting? She was able to pull her healing from Jesus without Jesus having to even command or say anything, say something. That's amazing. And one more passage we see in Matthew 14, verses 34 to 36. The Bible says this. When they had crossed over, they came to the land of Gennesaret. And when the men of that place recognized him, they sent out into all that surrounding region, brought to him all who were sick, and begged him that they might only touch the hem of his garment. And as many as touched it were made perfectly well. These people just touched Jesus' garments. And the Bible says that as many as touched it were made well. Without knowing their problems, information about sickness, nor not knowing who touched him. All who touched him, they were able to withdraw power because power is mechanical. Subsection 8. No one's permission is needed. There is this question in the body of Christ. Do I need the permission of the sick person or demon-possessed person to minister to them? This is a question that was asked many times and it might come to you at a certain point in time. Do I need the permission of the sick person or the demon-possessed person to minister to them? Technically, no. We don't need permission, especially in the case of a demon-possessed person. 
the Christian has been given authority over all the power of the enemy, as we've seen in Luke 10, 19. So I can cast devils out from anyone with no permission, because I have all authority in Christ Jesus. If you're dealing with a demon-possessed person, you don't know if the person or the demon will answer when you ask for permission to minister. If the person is possessed by the demon, the demon might answer you. You ask, do I have permission to minister you? And the demon says, no. So who, who said that? The demon or the person? You don't know. So you can go ahead and deliver that person. And if she wants the bondage back, if she wants that demon back, she can get it very easily. But the Bible says that after a demon is casted out, he goes in places without water and then comes back to the same house, which is now clean. And he brings seven more with him. So if the person who is delivered by you without permission wants the bondage back, she can get it back very easily, no problem. And she will probably be even seven times happier, right? In the case of sick people now, not demon possessed, you might have to ask for permission of the person or, or their family if they are unconscious. If a person is unconscious, you ask for permission to minister from the family. I'm saying that because some sick people might be offended by Jesus and his teachings and they might not even want ministry like it happened in Jesus' own town. Some people don't want to be ministered by Jesus. They are offended by Jesus. So you need to ask permission if they want to be healed. I even uh, met some crazy cases where the handicapped, they prefer their handicap because they got some benefits from the state, some money, and they prefer, prefer not to be healed. I, I met such cases, and there might be such cases. In those cases, you need the permission of the person with the problem, with the sickness, to, to, so that you can minister to them. Amen? Other than that, we don't need any other permission to minister to the sick. Jesus has all authority in heaven and earth. That means the devil has none. No authority whatsoever. And we are operating under Jesus' authority. Amen? So here I wanted to bring a few practical things about the permission. And this whole chapter is about practical things, practical questions that people ask from time to time. And I, I gather them all here and I try to answer them. And now subchapter 9. We talk about the fact that ministering to the sick can be done anywhere. Healing can be done anywhere, at work, at school, in the restaurant, in the grocery shop. It doesn't necessarily need to happen in church. And that might be something shocking for many. You don't need to heal, the pe heal people just in, in church or just in big crowds on stadiums. You can heal anyone at the grocery shop. Just lay your hands or speak quietly so that you not embarrass anyone and just heal the people. Also, you don't need an atmosphere for healing or a certain worship atmosphere or even a worship leader to make this power work. You must always be ready and stirred up to minister to anyone anyway. You must be as a person prepared, stirred up, prayed up in tongues, and then you're ready to minister to anyone. You don't need to create first an atmosphere for healing, for miracles, to create the right worship atmosphere, the right instruments, the right songs. No, there's no such thing. You can minister, you just need to be stirred up, full of faith in the word, and just go minister. And when you worship, you don't even need music all the time. If there's music, that's great. It's even better. But if there's no music, there's none, you can go ahead and worship by yourself and pray in tongues. Pray your own songs. Go and walk and pray. And whenever you pray in tongues, you are worshiping. Amen. So worship is mainly through music. Music is divine. Music helps us a lot to be stirred up. But if you don't have music, that doesn't mean you cannot get stirred up. You cannot be in faith. You cannot use your mouth to pray and to be stirred up. Amen. And be prepared. I think we'll stop here and I, I believe we have one more session and we will be done and we'll still have a few th more things to talk about, uh, about how to minister healing in a practical way. And until we meet in our, in our, for our last session of this series, I pray that God will bless you and help you through this teaching, through everything that was said to be able to activate yourself and to go heal the sick, cast out devils, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, minister, bring this word of reconciliation to the people, to the world. 
and start doing the ministry. Start doing what God has made you to be, what God expects you to do and take responsibility for the work of the kingdom. Amen.